So, uh, so the homework is to be uploaded or moved. Don't come by looking for me to hand me or hard copy. Okay, so you can uh, type it up, and I'm not sure if the Moodle upload has been enabled. If not, I'll check after class today. It's not. It's not enabled. I will. I'm sure that that is uh, enabled today. <coughs> Same is true of the lab. You're supposed to turn in your lab electronically or to Moodle. Everything is lost. Nothing is ever going to get lost. So that's a good thing. And you will get your grades back on Moodle as well. Okay. So lab over. I will announce the date of the first midterm on Thursday. Okay. We have two midterms and a final exam. So one midterm is going to be in October, one in November, finals are in December. So I need to get a room first. Uh, as soon as I have a room confirmation, I will announce that first midterm is going to be sometime early to middle. So most likely, kind of trending towards middle. It won't take place during class time? It will be an evening exam, as is typical for this class, simply to not have time pressure. I could do an in-class exam, but then we are limited to 75 minutes. Okay? I try not to make you sort of sweat under the time clock. So if you need an extra, I mean, I usually have 90 minute exams, but 75 minutes. If you want a 75 minute exam, I could do that. Don't have to come back in the evening. Just me know. I feel that you know, doing it without time pressure is a little better. So I will announce that on Thursday. And uh, I would also like to request people not use laptops in class. I think everybody is getting incredibly distracted, not paying any attention, and distracting people around me. Okay, that would be much appreciated. Okay, so I will continue the discussion from last time. We had started talking about threads. If you remember, I talked about user level threads, kernel level threads, threads packages. So what we really want to do as far as OS is concerned is to understand how threading and synchronization is implemented in the kernel. Okay, so the assumption is since 2.30 is a prereq for this class, and I know that some of you have taken it, but be that as it may, uh, the assumption is threading, uh, you know what threads are, you know what concurrency means. So what we really want to do here is not just repeat the same material, but rather go and understand what OS support do you need to implement these abstractions? Just as we have looked at processes and process management in the kernel, we are going to look at synchronization and what kernel support do you need for that. So some, there may be a little bit of repetition because I need to first explain the concept and then talk about what hardware support or what OS support is needed. Okay. So we will start with synchronization and I will define it for those of you who have not had the benefit of two things. Those of you have forgotten what is in 230. I'm going to go back and uh, the first bullet is wrong. There is no wrap up. That was two classes ago. Uh, we are going to be doing synchronization. I'll define synchronization. I will revisit this too much milk problem, which you should have done in 230. I presume you remember too much milk. Okay, so we'll revisit, we'll revisit that again just to set the stage for understanding what synchronization is and what we really need to do in the kernel. Once you understand what synchronization primitives are, I'll show you how to go and implement it either by using this concept of interrupts or by using atomic instructions. Okay? Back in the very first class, when, or rather the second class, when I was talking about hardware support, I talked about atomic instructions and I said we'll revisit that when we do synchronization. That is going to happen today. So really, uh, we'll lead off from too much milk. We'll talk about a little bit about locks. 
and then I'm going to uh, explain how you actually implement it, yeah. how you go about implementing support for logs. Okay, so this is uh, what you should have done in already. already. Just a quick recap. So this is an abstract problem that shows why coordination is necessary between two entities. Okay? In this case, we are going to use you and your uh, dorm uh, roommate as an example, but uh, they could be two threads or two processes as well. And here, the problem is one where you are trying to ensure that your uh, refrigerator is always well stocked. And we are going to use milk as a proxy for anything you keep in your refrigerator. And the assumption is that uh, that uh, you and your roommate cooperate to ensure your refrigerator is always well stocked. So let's just see what happens if you don't coordinate this well. Okay, so, so if the, the column is access down this time, so you arrive from your class at 3, you look in the refrigerator, there are the milk, you decide I'm going to go to the grocery store, it will be at 3.10, uh, your roommate arrives at 3.15, Roommate looks at the refrigerator, says no milk, goes to the grocery store to buy milk. Meanwhile, you are at the grocery store, you buy milk, you come home, you put milk in the refrigerator, you feel good, you did something for your roommate. The roommate comes back, same thing, put milk in the refrigerator, you are too much. Okay. Right, so clearly you decided to do something without coordinating with your roommate and you ended up now not with no milk but more milk than you need. Okay, and so we use this abstract problem to motivate why you need synchronization, okay, number one, and then we will look at how to implement synchronization. Okay, so let me, first of all, before I move on, are there any questions here? For those of you who may be seeing this for the first time. Okay, so we just want to solve this problem. Okay, this is a problem, so we'll see how you can use synchronization to solve this problem. Okay, so, let me define synchronization. It's use of atomic operations to ensure cooperation between threads or processes. Okay, we will look at synchronization in the context of threads, but you can synchronize across processes as well. Okay? So I use the word atomic operation. I did not define that. You know what that means? Anybody care to take a guess? What is an atomic operation? Yes. Uh, are those like the, uh, the really low level like assembly um, operations that you can have? Um, that are supported by the hardware, like add. So you are uh, talking about assembly instructions. Oh, okay. okay. So assembly instructions could be atomic, but atomic operation is an independent concept from an assembly instruction. So what does atomicity mean? Yes. It means that the instruction executes as if it was one step, so there's no possibility for a context switch while that uh, operation is executing. Okay. So atomicity means indivisible, as somebody just mentioned. What atomic operation means is the entire operation, whether it's one assembly instruction, whether there's many instructions on of, of C code or whatever it is, they all operate as one logical unit. It's all or nothing. The whole thing operates all as at once as if it was one logical instruction, or none of it of, uh, executes. You cannot actually break that atomic operation into any smaller units. Okay? So, so what, what that also means is once your OS has started executing it, the whole set has to execute. You cannot do context which it's like you take take it and execute the whole block. Okay? So that is what we mean by atomic operation. Atomicity is at the heart of synchronization. The reason we are able to do synchronization is because we can make groups of uh, instructions atomic which means if you are working on something, nobody else can because it's the using. So we'll come back to why, how atomicity helps us. But synchronization is defined in terms of atomicity. So you're saying the use of atomic operations to ensure cooperation. Okay, we'll come back to atomic operations uh, as we go through this lecture. Okay, so other concept you should keep in mind, mutual exclusion. Okay, mutual exclusion is a form of synchronization. Mutual exclusion means if one entity is doing something, it prevents anyone else from doing the same thing. Okay? So it's in this case, if one thread is doing a particular activity, it excludes someone else from doing something. Okay? It is a way of coordination. There are many ways to do synchronization and coordination. Okay? But mutual exclusion is one such method. 
I mean, mutual exclusion, if you work on something, nobody else can. The system will prevent someone else from doing it. Okay. Third term we have defined here is a critical section. Okay. A critical section is a piece of code that one and only one thread or process can execute at any given time. It's any piece of code, so let's assume it's a multi-threaded process. It's a piece of code, which would be a function, it could be a small piece of code, and only one thread can execute. If some other thread tries to execute it, when some thread is executing it, it will be stopped from doing so. Okay? Mutual exclusion and critical section are closely related, as you can see. A critical section is a piece of code that is ensuring mutual exclusion. So I said that only one thread can do an activity and it prevents someone else. Critical section is also a piece of code that only one thread can use. Okay, so you implement critical sections using mutual exclusion. Okay. Last concept for this class is of that of a lock, something you should have heard of. Okay. A lock is a mechanism or an abstraction that prevents another thread or a process from doing something. Okay. So the idea behind writing any synchronization code is you will implement a lock before you enter a critical section and you will release the lock when you exit the critical section. And we'll come back to all of this just a moment. But I just want you to keep in mind what synchronization means, what mutual exclusion means, what critical section means. Okay, locks you should know already. Okay, so there are these three terms that we'll come back and look. Okay, so we'll try to solve this problem of too much. Work. Okay, again, something you should have gone through. Here's a very simple solution. Okay, you want to now start coordinating with your roommate. Simplest way to coordinate, you leave a note, so you inform your roommate you are doing something. Okay? So, I will switch to threads rather than people. Okay, so, we will assume that there is a thread A and thread B that the both threads are cooperating to solve the too much milk problem. Okay? So, what does thread A do? It says is if there is no milk in your refrigerator and there is no note on the refrigerator, then you leave a note saying I am going to go buy milk you go buy milk, you remove the note. Okay? That's what thread A is going to do. Thread B is going to do the same thing. It's going to check, is there milk in the refrigerator? If there is no milk, is there a note on the refrigerator? So when roommate is already gone and try to buy milk, if both of those are negative, there's no milk and no note, you say, I'm going to go and do it. I leave a note, buy milk, and remove the note. So let's assume you write this code and you let it execute. And then the question is, will you end up in a situation with too much work? Or will this solution work? Okay, I should mention uh, what we are trying to achieve first in the too much work problem. So we want to write a piece of code, multi-threaded okay, uh, uh, process, where you ensure that one person, only one thread, can buy milk at any given time. Okay, and someone buys milk. So one is uh, in, in context of any of these synchronization problems or even in distributed system, you have properties of the program. Those are what are called correctness properties. If your, if your pro program achieves those properties, it is presumed to be correct. So these are the correctness properties we want from any program. Right? So any program that satisfies those property, we will accept as a valid solution for the too much miss problem. Okay? And then you only are trying to achieve two conditions that you neither want too much milk nor do you want no milk. Okay? A trivial solution to the too much milk problem is you arrive, you look in the refrigerator, say too much milk, there is no milk, you say forget it, I am not going to drink milk. Okay? If you are lazy, you solve the problem, you will never have too much milk. Okay? But that is not a good solution, that is a solution that does essentially nothing. Okay? So the second condition is someone buys milk. Okay, you not only want to not have too much milk, you don't want to have no milk at all. Okay, so, so in distributed system, these are also called safety property and liveness property. Safety property means that always means nothing bad happens. Liveness property usually means something good happens. The first property says that if uh, only one person should buy milk, otherwise something bad is going to happen. Too much milk. Second property is liveness, means something good should happen. Somebody should buy milk. Not being have a live program is also a trivial solution to this question. So this would only work if the if statement and the leave note statement were atomic, right? right. So right now this is just code you are written in C. Yeah. Okay, this variable you check is a no milk, if no node equal equal zero. So there is no atomic, no you do not put logs, do not put 
I mean, you are just sort of written plain vanilla code and you ask what can happen. So this wouldn't work? Yeah, this would not work and why would it not work? What could happen? Uh, you could, one thread A could check the if statement. It comes back as no milk and no note. Then context switch. Thread B goes and checks, finishes its whole operation, goes back to thread A, thread A leaves a note, buys milk, and you have too much milk. Okay. So there is a solution, uh, uh, solution, an execution sequence that is just being proposed. And the, and the, the, the proposal is that will violate one of those properties. Okay. So first of all, if you have this code, you have to, and if I ask you, is this code going to work or not, you have to think, what does that mean? So if you claim that it works, so you should say that no matter how these threads execute, those two properties are always true. My correctness properties always hold no matter what happens, how thread A executes and how thread B executes. Okay? What does it mean how thread A and how thread B executes? We assume that you can, the CPU scheduler is free to do whatever it wants in terms of how it schedules A and B and the solution should still be correct. Okay? So what that means is the CPU scheduler may run a small piece of thread A it may say I'm going to switch to thread B or some other thread and it comes back to thread A and no matter in what order thread A and thread B execute, if those two properties always hold, that's the correct solution. Okay? But if you find even one sequence, if you say, if you execute these two statements and these two and then these two and see what happens and you find a way to violate one of those properties then the solution is not going to work. We have found a solution that is not correct. So we violated the property. So what was proposed just now is a way by which we can violate one of these properties, in particular the safety property. Okay, so here is a sequence. Let's say CPU scheduler runs, picks thread A for execution, you execute this if statement. Is there milk? No milk. Is there node? There is no node. Okay, and then the uh, thread enters the if statement. Okay? So at this point, let's say it's quantum or time slice expires. Okay? So now Let's say you're doing that round robin scheduler that I was mentioning. So you say your time has expired, so I'm going to run something else on the CPU. So you run thread B. Okay? Thread A is suspended at this point. It's just entered the if statement. It hasn't done anything. Just entered the if statement and you executed thread B. Thread B comes and says, is there milk? There is still no milk. Thread A hasn't yet gotten it. Neither has it left a node because we just suspended it right before. Okay? So the if statement is still true. Okay? So thread B will enter the if statement. And now you are in trouble because both of these threads have entered the if statement, which means both of them are going to bind. Okay. So, so in particular, thread B could just finish this entire if statement. Okay. So it goes and buys milk, and then you context switch back to A. This is exactly the solution that we mentioned here. You go leave your node, you do all this, and you have to okay. So we found one execution sequence that violates our safety property. And you have ended up with too much milk. So that means this is not a correct solution. Okay. You can't say it works sometimes and it doesn't work sometimes. So, I, so when it works, it works correct. That's not acceptable. Okay. Whenever you have concurrency, correctness means no matter how your scheduler works, okay, it should always behave the right way. Okay. Clearly, there are execution sequences where this will actually produce the right solution. Thread A could just execute this entire statement get milk and thread B executes and there is already milk, so it doesn't even enter okay. That should work, but that's not what we are saying. If you find one sequence, you are in trouble. That's what the code is concerned. Okay, so this one doesn't work. So here's a second solution. Here, you are basically going to leave uh, named nodes. Okay. So thread A is going to basically sign its node. So it says, I'm going to leave a note. So I am thread A, I'm going to go by milk, and then I'm going to check, is there a node from thread B. If there is no node from thread B, I'm going to check. Is there milk in the refrigerator? If there's no milk in the refrigerator, I'll go by milk. Okay. And thread B does the same thing, except that it first leaves node B. It's going to check whether there's node A. It's going to check node B and so on, and remove the node. Okay. Different piece of code trying to achieve the same, so solve the same. First question is, will this work? Will this satisfy our safety, liveness properties? Can we make the code break? Yes. Um, if we do a context switch after a 
thread A leaves a note, and thread B also leaves a note, then neither could buy the note. So what is being proposed, if I may paraphrase, is that this one can uh, violate our liveness property. You can come up with an execution sequence where nothing can happen, nothing is going to happen in the system. Okay, so what was just mentioned is, let's say thread A runs first. Okay, it goes and leaves a node. Okay? And then you immediately context switch. Okay? Thread B run, it leaves a node. Okay? Context switch back to A. What is A checking? Is there a node from B? There is a node from B. So basically, it's not going to enter the if statement at all. Okay, so it's basically saying, B is going to buy milk. I don't need to do anything. So you go come here, context switch back to B. You say, is there a node from A? There is still a node from A. So a, B will assume that A is going to buy milk. Okay, it's not going to enter the if statement. And then you basically come back, you remove node A, you remove node B. It will end up with a solution where neither of the thread bought milk, because they each assume that the other thread is going to buy. So this is the case where nothing good has happened. You didn't end up with too much milk, but you didn't end up with any milk because each thread assumed that the other one was going to do the task. Okay. So this solution violates the second property, the liveness property. Nothing good has happened. It could be in a wide loop where this happens continuously. Doesn't mean it will happen. But as I said, if there's any one execution sequence where you can break the property, it's an incorrect solution. Okay, this may well function well right most of the time, but once in a while if this execution sequence actually occurs, uh, this is the way this threads execute, you are basically out of this. No yes? Okay. Solution three. Okay, we make life more difficult. We say we are going to actually uh, make thread A smarter. So I will show the code and I will explain the intuition. So here again you leave a node. So thread B is the same as the last line. Okay? You leave a node, you say did A leave a node? If A has not left a node, then you check is there milk and if not, you buy it. So you say has my roommate left a node? And if not, you check. And if, and if there is a node, there is nothing to do with the okay? Here, basically say A is going to leave a node. And then if you actually see a node from B, you are going to sit in this while okay, You just cycle in this while okay. And then once the node from B is gone, then you see is there milk in the refrigerator. And if not, you go buy milk and you remove it. Okay, so if you want to understand what this code is doing, it essentially says that one of you is paranoid that neither of you will get, get end up with milk. So if you see that the other person has actually left a node, you are going to stand there and wait for the other person to return. And then you check after the note is taken out, the milk actually appear in your fridge. And so only then will you go. If not, then if you say, if we just left a note and took that note off and didn't do anything, then I'm going to go by you. So I'm going to wait and I'm not going to assume the other, I trust my roommate to actually deliver. Okay? Asymmetric code. A is doing more work just to ensure that there is some milk. So now let's ask what is the work of it. So this is the solution. Yes. You can still end up in a situation where there are both uh, where there are two nodes, um, mm -hmm. and then nobody will do anything. So. Okay, so explain a scenario where that actually happens. You have to come up with a sequence that says this happened and that thread ran and it executed this, and then you show us constructively that that actually results in a problem. That's what we would accept as a valid way to break the solution. A is paranoid. 
A is going to stand there for two hours waiting for B to come back, waste all the time they have. That's true. Yeah, so it is going to sit there in a while loop and essentially do nothing. And that's not a good thing. But let's not ask whether it's an efficient solution. Let's ask whether it's a correct solution. A correct solution doesn't have to be an efficient solution. It just means that it works. It may not work particularly well, but it works. Yes, there's an efficiency problem. You're absolutely right. But that was not in our correctness property. You know, we didn't say code must also be efficient. If you had added that, then the solution would be better. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, no. No. Not wrong. OK. So I'm not going to uh, <laughs> with the point. You can go and look at all possibilities. Yes, we have something I to say. I think I've got a break. OK. Oh, right. Wait. Um, oh, no, 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 we do nothing. No? Yeah, I can't break it. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to uh, assert, not true to you, but just assert that this code actually works. Okay. It's a correct solution. Okay. Now, if it took 30 of you 15 minutes and you can't still convince yourself that it works, it's fair game that if some programmer writes this code and you ask somebody to debug it, they won't either. Okay? Because it's not easy to understand. You have no idea what's actually happening. Code is not even symmetric. Okay? And this is just two threads. If I say now do it for n threads, n of you have to cooperate and buy milk, each of our, if you actually generalize this solution for each thread, you would have to write a different piece of code. In all the previous ones, our code was actually identical. So if you figured out how it worked for one, it worked the same way. Here, it doesn't work the same way for both. Right? It works differently. Okay? Now, there's a solution here which I'm going to skip because there's no point just trying to prove it. Just take it from me that it is going to work, that you can't actually break it because that the simple point is since one thread is actually parallel, is waiting there and trying to double check whether something good or bad is happening, it actually works. So you have one thread taking care of all the bad cases, which is thread A. And then you have neither too much or too little milk. But we don't like the solution. Okay? Forgetting the fact that it is not efficient, let's ignore that for a moment. We don't like the solution because it's hard to convince ourselves it works. Okay? We possibly, most people will not even think of this solution. Okay? And if you thought of it, it's hard to convince someone else that this is right. Okay? I'm not even going to try to convince you. But So we want a more elegant solution. We don't want solutions that are hard because it's hard to generalize this kind of thing. So, so we want uh, abstractions that make it very easy to write code and solve problems like this. And it should be low. Just looking at it, you should be able to convince us, yes, this is going to work. Okay, so we don't want to complicate our life. Okay, so we say, this is a good solution. It's complicated. It's asymmetric. It's indeed not efficient. A is busy waiting. It's wasting resources. Doing uh, no good work, okay? and we don't like it for all of these reasons. So what can we do? Okay, what we can do is actually build abstraction both into the OS and into the language that will allow us to solve problems like this very easily. Yeah, and that's where synchronization comes in. Okay? We will look at three abstractions. I don't know if you have done the other two. Locks we should have done in two and okay? zoom. We are also going to do semaphores and monitors. Did you do semaphores? What did you actually do? All three? Semaphores and locks. You did semaphores and locks. And then we'll do monitors as well. Turns out monitors are actually built into Java. So if, uh, if we actually do Java that's built in most of our okay. So we'll do we'll look at three synchronization abstractions, locks, monitors, and semaphores. And as far as uh, power goes in terms of ability to solve any synchronization problem, that equal. Given any synchronization problem, if you give me locks, semaphores, or monitor, you should be able to come up with solutions to solve that problem. Code may look slightly different, but you can't. Uh, it's not the case that there are some synchronization problems that only locks can solve and semaphores can't or vice versa. They are equivalent in terms of expressive power and ability to address some synchronization problem. Yeah, that's number one. Number two, which is really what is of interest to us is they all require OS support and more importantly hardware support. Okay. They will also involve waiting as we will see. Waiting means threads that are blocked for something to happen. Okay. 
So what we would like to do is actually not just go back and revisit what blocks and what semaphores do. We'll do that quickly. But then we'll look at how are you actually going to implement it inside the OS or in a, let's say, a, a synchronization library. Okay. So let's do that. Let's start with logs. The yeah, logs provide mutual exclusion. Any log abstraction has two uh, methods on it, an acquire method and a release method. You always use the acquire method to get a lock. Initially, the lock is assumed to be free. The basic idea is uh, if you hold a lock, you can prevent somebody else from getting the lock. That's what it means. You basically close the lock, and then nobody else can enter. That's the abstraction. Okay? So you always try to get the lock. Okay? And uh, the way the acquire method works is it checks. If the lock is free, you get it. If the lock is not free, you wait okay? until the lock becomes free, and then you get the lock at some later point. So when you enter the acquire method, you can you may either exit it immediately with the lock if the lock is already available, or you may wait for some indeterminate amount of time until whoever is holding the lock gives it up and the OS hands it to you. Oh, sorry, the library hands it to you. Okay. Well, release basically just releases the lock. Okay. It releases the lock and, in, and actually inside you have to if some other thread was waiting. The lock is then actually explicitly handed to one of the waiting threads or processes. Okay. That's what acquire and release does. The way it's very easy to write, uh, use lock always. So you basically say, this is the, uh, the, the code that I want to protect with a lock. Okay. And just before you uh, start executing the code, you say lock dot acquire. And when you're done executing that piece of code, you say lock dot release. You release the lock once you're done. Okay, and the code that is sitting between acquire and release is going to be called a critical section. Okay, because by definition, you say that if some thread is in a critical section, it actively excludes anyone else from entering it. And locks will do that. Okay? And locks are implementing mutual exclusion. Okay, so this is our too much milk problem using locks. Very simple solution. So lock acquire. If check if there's no milk, if not go buy milk, release a lock. Okay, and you're done. This will work for arbitrary number of threads. Okay? And now it's very easy to convince ourselves that this code is going to work. Okay? Let's try it and see. So what happens if, let's say, thread A executes. So initially, the lock is free. Okay? When thread A runs, it's going to execute log acquire. Okay? The lock is free, so it's going to get the lock okay? and come out of the acquire method. Okay? So now it's in, in this part. And then it's going to execute this code. Okay, now, once it has acquired the lock, it doesn't matter what the CPU scheduler does. Okay, the lock still belongs to thread A. Okay. In particular, if thread B runs, it's going to execute lock acquire. And since the lock is in use, it will block. It can't do anything. Okay, it has to wait for thread A to release the lock before it can do it. So even if any other thread runs, once you've entered the critical section, you're actively blocking them from even entering it and executing it. So the order of scheduling is now no longer material. It doesn't matter what the CPU scheduler is. Okay? Once some thread has entered, so it could have been thread B that's entered the uh, critical section first. That doesn't matter. Once any thread enters it, all other threads are prevented from it. Okay? So you know that only one thread can execute this piece of code at any given time. So only one thread can buy milk at any given time. And once you release the lock, then some other thread will enter. But by that time, you already bought milk. So it is not it's going to first check if there is milk and if there is no actually go buy milk and so OK? So it's symmetric. Same word, much simpler, easier to reason. Once you know the, how locks work, you can argue that this code is actually going to work, that it is going to satisfy or safety property, or liveness property. It generalizes to arbitrary number of threads and so on. Okay. So much easier to understand. And now we want to understand what is this, what's inside a lock. How do you actually achieve whatever we are trying to do? Okay. How do you implement a lock? That's really what we want to do. So as it turns out, uh, most synchronization primitives will require not only OS support, but hardware level support. Without that, it's very hard to implement synchronization control. Okay. The two things that mechanisms we can actually uh, depend on okay, are uh, 
do this for a moment. It's enabling and disabling of interrupts and atomic instructions like test and set. Okay, you probably don't know what either of these two mean. I will explain those. Okay, we'll assume that load and store instructions, by definition, that's a single assembly instruction, so it's always atomic. Okay, typically, whenever a CPU scheduler switches from one uh, process to another, it always switches at the end of an instruction. You never switch in the middle of an assembly instruction. You always wait for the current assembly instruction to finish, and then you switch. So by definition, any single assembly instruction like load and store will always be atomic. So you can execute the whole thing and be assured that you're not going to switch in between. Okay? So that is not, a, you're not even going to think about that. These are the two abstractions we will look at and understand how to implement locks, next class how to use them to implement semaphores and so on. Okay. Okay. So f first one we'll look at is how do you use interrupts to enable uh, disabling. Okay. So what does disabling interrupts mean? What disabling interrupt means is basically if you say I don't want to process interrupts, you disable interrupts. Okay. At that point if an interrupt actually comes into the system, this, the OS is going to ignore it. Okay, by default, if an interrupt is raised, remember what I said in the earlier. If, if you raise an interrupt, you suspend execution of the current process. You save its state, you switch to an interrupt service routine, you do whatever the interrupt asks you to do, and you execute. Okay. The particular kind of interrupt we are trying to disable here, What? why are we trying to disable interrupts? What do we gain by it? What interrupt are we trying to the scheduler uses a timer interrupt to call back in the kernel and tell it that the, the time to hold is up, doesn't it? Yes. So the interrupt we are trying to ignore here is the timer interrupt. Okay. So the, remember how I mean, when I talked about CPU scheduling, I said there's a time slice. For preemptive scheduler, you set a timer. Let's say your time slice is 200 milliseconds. You start executing a process, you set a timer. Whenever the timer expires and 200 milliseconds are passed, the timer raises an interrupt. Okay. This causes the OS to suspend execution of the process. It enter, enters the timer service routine. It says call the CPU scheduler for time point of expiry. CPU scheduler schedules something else. Okay. How do we ensure synchron? One easy way to ensure synchronization is to somehow disable CPU scheduling from switching to another thread when this thread is executing. Okay. We are guaranteed that once I start executing this critical section, the CPU scheduler will not run. Then you will actually get whatever synchronization properties. Okay, the way we will do it is mask interrupts. In particular, we want to mask the timer interrupt. Yes, what is the purpose that on a unicorn machine as opposed to a multi machine? Yes. So I will also mention that all of this is only meant to work on a unicore system. In a multi processor or a multi core, there are other problems. Okay, because you may have threads A and B executing on the same core or two different cores at the same time. Okay. Locks will still enable us to do certain things, but in this case, I'm just talking about single core for the moment. Okay, like don't worry about multiple. That's how to understand how to solve a simple problem. Then we'll see how to solve more complicated problems. Yes, you have a question too. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of not relevant, but anyway, like, so, like, if you have um, something that goes into a critical section and you know that it's going to go over the quantum, um, will the scheduler just, like, block before it goes into that section? Right, so once you disable the interrupt, you are actually going to let the thread execute. Okay? It may go over its time slice. In particular, the OS has actually lost control of this. This thread may actually, if it goes into an infinite loop or something, you are in trouble. Okay? So you want to ensure that whenever you disable interrupts, you are actually careful because the OS is saying, because hardware is actually allowing the OS to do certain things. The OS is saying, I'm not going to switch this thread off. And the thread starts misbehaving and doesn't exit the critical section, the thread is just going to take over the CPU. So you want to be careful that whenever you disable interrupt, you do it very carefully. Okay, you only want to do it in the right way. But this is a solution. It can actually have unintended consequence if you have done code and whatnot. You will see how to do it better, but it is a solution if you want to do it. Okay. So the simple approach what we are going to use is in log.acquire, we will give the log to the thread, but then we are going to disable interrupts. So what that means is once you start executing this code, the CPU scheduler won't even run. Okay, you cannot switch by definition to another thread. You will wait for the whole critical section to finish. You will re-enable interrupts here, at which point CPU scheduler is free to run. Okay. 
the timer interrupt that may have arrived in between will actually fire only after you re-enable the computer. So once, this is not a brute force solution. You say, if the CPU scheduling is messing up my code, I'm going to disable the schedule. That's essentially what we are saying. Okay, not the most elegant way to do it, but it is a way to do it. Okay, so if you have long critical sections, you may exceed your time slice by large periods, and so on and so forth. Okay? So here is a library implementation, pseudo code library implementation of the lock class. Okay, this is actually C plus plus code looking to the Java, it doesn't matter what the language is, it's all pseudo code. Okay, so the require and release are the two methods. Okay? This is the constructor which says when you initialize a new or rather declare a new lock, you always set its value to empty, meaning uh, zero, which means that lock is free. There's a queue associated with the lock. That's a queue of all the threads that are waiting on the lock. Okay, that's a wait queue for that lock. A wait queue of threads. So that queue is also empty. Okay? So this is the acquire method. Okay, we'll assume it's a system call. Okay? So what do we do? We disable interrupts in this case. Okay? At this point, see, this is uh, CPU schedule is not running. Right? So this, so you check is the lock available or not. The lock is busy. Okay? You say that somebody else holds the lock. I'm going to take this thread, add it to the wait queue, and put the thread to sleep. Yeah, basically, it's not going to run anymore. Okay? If the lock is available, then you basically just get the lock, the re-enable interrupts, and you. Okay? It's a better solution than what I was just showing as the brute force solution. The brute force solution, I said, you will disable interrupts here, and you re-enable interrupts there. Okay? And the CPU scheduler won't run anywhere in between. What I'm showing now is a much better solution where only the lock acquire class is where uh, the method is where you enable and uh, disable interrupt, and you just do what you want without getting interrupted. Okay, so what are we doing just to understand one more time? This is where the scheduler cannot run when you're executing. So this is your atomic operation. The entire acquire method executes atomically. Because once you enter it and disable interrupts, you will run uh, this whole unit before you get kicked off this. All you're doing is atomically checking, is the lock available? If the lock is not available, the thread that wants to acquire the lock is made to wait. Okay? Or if the lock is available, the thread <coughs> the lock is given to the thread. That's all you're doing. Okay? And the same thing happens in disable, uh, release. To disable the interrupts, you check, is there uh, some thread waiting for this lock? If so, you will take that thread of the wait to and hand it the lock that wait queue is empty, then nobody is waiting for the lock, you just reset the value of the lock to free. You have in the value of the lock. Okay? What that also means is in this solution, only these statements execute atomically. This one does not. Okay? So you may do lock acquire, you enter here, and you may at least switch to thread, a scheduler may switch you to thread B. But it will still work, because you will just comment the lock acquire and we put to sleep in here. You still hold it along. Okay. So the method basically is if some thread holds a lock and you are somebody else calls it, they are going to go to sleep. That's what the board does this question. So this kind of assumes that like um, the you know threads entering these critical sections are smart enough to acquire the lock in the first place. Yes. What there's like a malicious thread that just decides not to. Okay. So it's saying uh, the question is if you are assuming that any thread that wants to enter a critical section is going to acquire the lock. What if some thread does not? Right? So the assumption is you are writing the code as the programmer. If you write code where one of your threads which was entering a critical section did not get the lock, you wrote buggy code. Okay? These threads are not written by some independent parties. There is one program that you, the programmer, wrote. So the assumption is you do the right stuff to ensure correctness. It is not independent processes that are competing with one. Right? This is all your code. So that's the exemption. Okay. Is this clear what how to use the notion of interrupt to implement locks? I'm going to show a better, easier to understand solution. Okay, this is going to work and it requires hardware support to disable interrupts. But it's a fairly low level solution. Okay. Disabling interrupts is not generally a good idea. Any questions on this? Okay, if you write a, a lock library, okay, this is what you have to do, implement lock. 
depend on the interrupts or depend on uh, what are called atomic instructions. So let's come back to atomic instruction in particular test and set instruction. Okay, so uh, if you don't want like the previous solution for any reason, there's another hardware feature that you can use, equivalent. It's going to give us an equivalent implementation, it will also be correct implementation of law. And these are what are called atomic read modify write instructions. Okay, so on many uh, CPUs, you have an instruction here which is called atomic read modify write instructions. It basically does two operations in a single instruction. Okay? We assume one instruction is always atomic. Okay? If, if you can do multiple operations in the same instruction, in particular, you can read, modify, and write back the value of a variable all in one instruction, you can do some interesting stuff. Okay? But let's try to understand what this is. Okay? So there are many forms of this. We are only going to look at the first one called a test and set instruction. Okay? Test and set instruction is a very simple instruction. You basically say test and set and specify a variable. Let's say variable i. If you execute test and set assembly instruction on variable i, what this is going to do is going to read the value, current value of i. Okay? And that's what the instruction will return. And it'll always write one back to the instruction. So assume it's a binary variable, i is binary. So assume it starts with 0. Okay. First time you fire this instruction, it's going to read i. i will return 0, and you'll write 1. Okay. So you flip the bit in one instruction. You'll read the bit, you'll return that value, and you'll flip it on in new instructions. Okay. Normally, to write this code, you would basically have to have written multiple instructions. You'll basically read i and write Basically, you are going to do i equals to 1, which is going to write i. So these two instructions have been collapsed into a single assembly instruction. Okay, what this does for us, we will see. Right now, just understand what the instruction, assembly instruction does. Okay? Is that clear? So let's now understand what it is. The other two are equivalent, but we don't need to worry about it. Okay, so here is the implementation of locks and no interrupts anymore. Okay, just one assembly instruction will do it for us. Okay. Same acquire and release method. Okay. Your value is 0. This is all the constructor does. So all that acquire is doing okay, is running test and set on the value of the load. And in particular, you are sitting in a while loop. It says if test and set value equal to equal to 1, you are going to basically keep running. Okay. You are going to check the value of the lock. You are going to return the value of the lock and you are going to set it to 1. So try to understand and release is just going to reset the value. So what is this doing for us? Why is this going to work for us? Okay, let's first ask whether it. Yes, sir. I was going to say it sends it into the loop, and it's, it keeps looping until you send the value zero, and then it exits the loop. Okay. So let's ask what happens when initially the first thread calls a Okay. What's the initial value of the lock? First thread to call like one. Okay, you enter, you say while test and set of value. What's the value of value? What's the value of the lock is zero. Okay. Test and set on value is going to return a zero. Okay. And it's going to write a one atomically. That's what the instructions are. It returns the current value and it writes a one. Current value is zero, so it's going to return a zero, write a one. Okay. If it returns a zero, this condition will fail. Zero is not equal to equal to one. Okay. So, it will immediately exit the while. Okay. So, in one single instruction on test and set, you have acquired the lock, so you said we set the value to 1, okay. and you exited the while loop, and you are in the acquire, you sort of entire, entered the critical section. Is that clear what happens in the first thread? So, now let us assume thread B comes along and it calls acquire. Okay. What will happen? Now the value is 1 because thread A has just acquired the lock. It set the value to 1 by calling this test and set. What does B do? Okay. B is going to sit and loop here. Okay. Because it's going to say test and set value. Value is going to return a 1 and write back 1. Okay. And that true condition is true. Okay. That condition is true. It's going to keep executing the value. Okay. So it's stuck there until A is going to release the lock. Because test and set value is going to keep returning once. 
for the extra value that you say. But writing one back to that doesn't change its value. Okay. So any thread that calls acquire after the first thread enters is just going to get stuck on this. It's just going to keep executing. When B, when A eventually calls release, it will reset the value to zero. Okay. At that point, any thread that was sitting in that while loop will again do test and set on value. At this point, test and set will return a zero because the value has changed. Okay. And it will write back a one, but that will cause the while condition to fail. So it will exit that while loop and you enter acquire, which means you grab the lock at that point in time. <coughs> Okay. Could I repeat that? This is clear. So we are using because this is a single assembly instruction, we are guaranteed that the CPU scheduler is not going to kick you off in the middle of that instruction. Either you will be scheduled off context with before the instruction executed or after, but never in the middle. So this whole uh, test and set value will always execute atomically, and that is why we are safe from any issues that the CPU scheduler can create. And you are not going to get scheduled in the middle of an instruction. That's essentially what that atomic instruction bought us. Okay? If on the other hand, not actually written code, you would have said, if value equal to equal to zero, then do something, and then you are basically in trouble, because you can get scheduled out while you enter the if and Because you can do this whole thing in one assembly instruction, we are okay. Is that clear? So this is an implementation of a lock using this test and set atomic instruction that most hardware will support. You can do the same thing with these other two. This is the X86 actually does not have a test and set. It has a coolant one called exchange, which essentially does the thing. It just swaps two ones between the register and memory. So you can implement test and set by writing one to a register and essentially exchanging that value to a value. Okay, it's just going to read the value from memory and write whatever the register is. One is later. And all that is done atomically. Okay? All right. So the solution is correct, but it's a problem with the solution, which is that if you are if somebody other thread has grabbed the lock, you are going to be stuck. Doing a busy way. Yes, no, so you're actually using safety resources to write one. And yes. All you're doing is sitting and writing one repeatedly. <laughs> okay. And you're just looping the writing one, 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 one until somebody writes a zero and releases you from your busy. Okay, you're stuck. Okay. Not a good solution. You're wasting CPU cycles. You're doing nothing useful. It's the same thing that happened in our uh, uh, solution three, where you are just sitting there in front of the refrigerator and checking. And the load going, the load going, the load going. So this is called busy wait. It's a form of waiting where you are consuming CPU resources okay, and wasting CPU cycles doing nothing good. Okay. So we don't want that solution. Okay. Ideally, the thread, if it had gone to sleep and was woken up saying that thread, the lock has been released, now go and execute, that's a better solution. Okay. The lock is not available. That's what the interrupt solution did for us. It disabled interrupt check, is the lock available? If not, it put the thread to sleep. Okay, so you wait, you go to sleep, go sit on this wait queue, and once you are the thread the lock is available, you will be woken up. That solution does not waste resources. This solution wastes resources. Okay. So there is a way to make the solution better. It's a correct solution, but not an efficient one. Okay. There's a way to do it better. We can't avoid busy wait. If you have a test and set, you are basically going to have to have some form of busy waiting, but we can reduce the amount of busy waiting. In, the, in this case that I just presented, you are busy waiting all the way until the lock becomes available. Whereas you can reduce the amount of busy wait, here is a solution which we say is called minimal busy wait. Some little amount of busy waiting, not as much as the previous solution. So what does this do? This solution also has the same lock class acquire and release, but rather than checking the value of uh, the lock itself, what we are going to do is we are going to use test and set to ensure that only one thread can execute this uh, either a lock or release method at any given time. 
the way we are going to do this is we are going to add something called a guard statement. A guard statement basically says that if some thread is executing this, any part of this method, then any other thread that tries to enter this is going to get stuck there. It's like if you have a guard at the door, it says if someone is in the room, you're going to stand away, make that other person wait. And only when that person exits the room do you get to enter. Right? So this guard is basically saying only one thread goes into this method at any time. If someone is executing, you have to wait at this point. That's what a guard statement does. This is an implementation of the guard. Right? So what you do is you have a private variable called a guard. You set it initially, you set it to zero. So the first thread that calls acquire, okay, we'll basically do a test and set on guard. Test and set guard is going to return a zero and write one atomically. So this while this condition is going to fail, and that thread will enter. Okay. Now the value of guard has changed to one. Okay, that's what the test and set did. You started with zero. Then you, then you ran test and set, it basically wrote a 1. That's what test and set does. Okay? So at this point, if that thread is still executing, if another, let's see what happens if another thread tries to enter. Okay, what will it do? It's it stuck in the while loop, or there are only two things it can do. It can either move there or exit. Exit. The first thread is already exited, is written guard 1. Next thread goes and it will do test and set guard. I will return a 1, so 1 equals 1. So you just sit and loop. Okay. Any other thread that I try to enter are just going to sit there and do busy wait waiting for this function to finish. Yes. So like when the first function finishes, it sets guard to 0. And then the second function enters it, it yes. says it's 0, it goes to see if the value is free. And then it puts it to sleep. Yes. So I have not even said what's inside here. I was just showing how to write a guard for any uh, any function. This is in particular a guard that is being used to implement a lock method. You can put a guard on any function. Okay. A guard is doing exactly what a lock does. Okay. You are using an atomic version of a lock to implement a higher level lock abstraction. Okay. So, so here, so then let's now look at this. So first. Uh, thread went in, okay. it checked, is the value of the lock free? Remember, the guard is not the same as a lock, it's just a private variable. Okay. The initially, the lock is free, so you will basically get the lock inset busy and uh, set the lock to be busy and you will exit. Okay. And then here you also set the guard to zero. So if some other thread was stuck here waiting on the guard, it will get to enter. When it goes in, it will check is the value free? It's not free at this point. First thread grabbed the lock already. So this thread will be put on the wait queue for the lock and put to sleep. Then we release the case. Wouldn't it actually make more sense to have locks utilize the wait interrupt wait queue structure that's already in place? Okay. Question is, should it, is it not uh, uh, advisable to all use the wait queue structure that's already in place. Remember when I talked about the process control block, said so there are many states, there's a wait state, a run state, and I said there is a wait queue. And you go on the wait queue. Okay. Yeah. Question is why not go on that wait queue? Why are we why do we have yet another wait? Okay. So the reason uh, this is happening is although I said there was one wait queue, there isn't one. There's actually one wait queue per IO device. Is one wait queue for anything you can wait on. So I, because we have not done I.O. yet, I just represented all those wait queues as a single logical wait queue. So your disk will have a wait queue, your mouse will have a wait queue, your keyboard will have a wait queue, lock can have a wait queue, there are many wait queues. Okay. So basically in this case, you are stuck on the wait queue for this lock. Because the, the OS has to know what are you waiting on. The easiest way to know what you are waiting on is you wait in a special queue that tells it what you are waiting. You wait on the wait queue for a lock, it knows you are waiting for a lock. You wait on the wait queue for a disk, it knows you are waiting for some other. Right? So that's the, so it's not one queue. You are actually waiting on the right queue, which is a queue right. at the lock. Because it just seems to prevent you from having a situation where you're going to keep, say, getting stuck in a while loop where you keep writing one to a register. Um, to have you check the lock, 
If it's not available, you get put in a queue. As soon as someone releases the lock, that will call the interrupt to say, take the next person in the queue, and let them grab it, and that way you have no... Yes, that's so exactly what this is doing. Huh. Except that, so as you can see, forget the guard, we are checking, is the lock available? If the lock is not available, you put, get put on the wait queue, and then when the lock gets released, you check, is the queue is not empty, you are woken up. And put in the ID. That's exactly what this does for us. So the threads are not busy waiting on the lock. The maximum thing they can busy wait is for the acquire method to finish. And that's not a lot. You're just checking whether the queue is available. They're giving the lock or putting something into it. Much shorter than critical sections that a lock protest can be of arbitrary set. This is bounded, you know, that there are there's only an if and an else here. Okay. So that's why it's called minimal busy waiting. All you have to do is busy wait for this. This code has to execute atomic. Okay. And that's exactly what it does. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay, so we haven't gotten rid of busy waiting, yeah, as you can imagine. So it has reduced the amount of busy waiting by saying that I'm going to only busy wait on the acquire method instead of for the entire critical section to execute. Yeah, it gives us the same property. We reduce the amount. We made it better, but it's not the only way to not have it at all is to you have to go back to interrupts. Interrupts didn't have that problem. Okay, you just disabled interrupts and you let the, uh, the, the thread run and you did something similar. Okay. So the objective here is to understand, or not understand, but explain to you not just what synchronization is, but what is happening underneath. Okay. I mean, until now you've probably done some threads programming where you've done semaphore wait or lock acquire, lock release, but this is what is actually happening underneath. This is what the OS is doing. This is how why it works. Okay, so yes, question. So that function test and set guard. What exactly does that do? Okay, so what does it do? That's first of all, although it looks like a function, it's one inst assembly instruction. Okay, that is this assembly instruction here. Okay, you say test and set, and you pass in a variable i. Okay, it's going to read the variable value of i and return it and write one back to that. Variable. Yes, so if you have, oh. right, so that is what the magic first. Yes, okay, so you say test and set i. That's an assembly instruction. It will i is a variable somewhere in memory. It's going to read that value, and test and set will return that value. Think of it as a function that returns the value of i, and it sets i to one. Okay, so if i was zero, it will return zero and set i to one. If i is 1 already, it's just going to return 1 and write 1. Okay. So it's a single atomic instruction that is going to do read something, return it, and write. So that's why it's also called a read modify. These are called read modify write instructions. Typically, they execute atomically. They are in there precisely to enable the OS to implement synchronization. They are put in hardware for this very purpose, to implement locks. Okay. That's one of their primary uses. Okay, that typically you won't write any, first of all, you won't write assembly code. Okay, so I will continue this discussion. I can actually start some more course, but I don't want to right now. We will uh, resume the discussion on some of and monitors next time. If you came late, just to remind you, as homework out, as lab out, I'm going to announce exam time next week. Well, not next week, on Thursday. Okay. First one to do